Okay, so, ah, that's better. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Francis Church, 10 o'clock on this Sunday morning. Um, I'm Steve, and I'm leading the service today. Uh, Sarah will be talking to us later on, and I, I think your, your title is um, a mission. You're talking about priesthood, aren't you? That's better. That's part... What do you mean, oh? <laughs> and I'm not the front leading. Uh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Priesthood, a missional community, which is part of our series on the biblical image of the church. Oh, you will. Oh, thank you. My, prayers, my quick prayer has been answered. Um, so, welcome to those of you in the church. Welcome to those of you on Zoom. Um, after the service, please do stay for tea and coffee if you're here. And if you're on Zoom, uh, please do stay on and join one of the breakout rooms and have a chat with other people who are on Zoom. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens, who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and with princes of their people. Let's stand if we're able and just say these opening responses together and then we'll sing our first two songs. So if you come in with words that are in bold and I'll say the others. The world belongs to God. How good and how lovely it is. 
love and faith come together. If Christ's disciples keep silent, let's sing our first two songs. The first one is Strength Will Rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our God, our strong as we come to worship you this morning we thank you that as we lift you up so we feel you lifting up us, us up as well Lord Jesus just help us now to bring our praise and our worship to you you give life you are love Oh, 
Thank you. Please do take a seat. <clears throat> As we come to worship God on a Sunday, it's good just to remind ourselves about all the things that God has done for us and that we need to say sorry to him for all the things that we haven't done or have done. So we're going to say this confession together. So we say it all together. Saving God, we are your people, yet the world cannot see this. We are your children and fail to live in peace. We are your voices and choose to be silent. We are your hands and feet and walk a different road. Forgive us for ignoring your love, for brushing aside your hand and trusting our own wisdom. Enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to bring to you our joyful songs in the everyday moments of our lives, that your name might be glorified through our words and lives. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the collect for the day, the special prayer for today. Heavenly Lord, you long for the world's salvation. Stir us from apathy, restrain us from excess, and revive in us new hope, that all creation will one day be healed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Now today, the, um, apparently it's, it's Safeguarding Sunday. I've got that right, have I, Linda? And Linda's going to come up now and explain what that means and how that works. Good morning. Um, Safeguarding Sunday is just a, a day set aside by churches, not just churches of England or Methodist or URC, um, across the whole nation, just to raise the profile of safeguarding and what it is. Um, I am the parish safeguarding officer, very grand title, but <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, what exactly does that mean and what do I do? Um, <clears throat> church is a place where children and adults should be able to feel safe. And uh, it's my role to help us all to make this a safe place where people can feel safe. How do I do that? Um, you may notice that my photograph is on the inside of the toilet doors um, with contact details. There are more contact details up on the back, uh, the notice board. You'll also notice that, or you might have noticed, that there is a safeguarding policy statement um, posted at the back of the door that we review annually that states what we're doing, um, why we're doing it, and uh, is, can be referred to. It's also on our church website. So part of my role is to make sure that anybody who works with children or vulnerable adults has a DBS check from the Disclosure and Barring Service to make sure there's no skeletons in the closet. Um, I also ask people to do some training. The diocese provide modules of training for people to work through, learn from, um, to make everybody who works with children and vulnerable adults aware of possible pitfalls, things that should and shouldn't be done, ways in which to behave with these groups of people. Um, so training is required by anybody who takes on a role of responsibility in the church. Um, we report to the diocese. Um, I'm constantly in touch with them about the people who work in this church, and there's a large number of people who are checked and trained, which is wonderful. Um, I also have a role where or a responsibility, along with the leadership of the church, to respond to any concerns that are raised, um, either directly to me, through the diocese, to any member of the leadership team um, that, uh, that it receives a concern would be passed on to me, and together we would work through how we can deal with that sort of situation, how we can support people in need. So what can you do to help? Um, if you are the leader of a group, then obviously I will have been speaking to you about training and uh, having checks and so on. Those checks have to be renewed every three years to make sure that we're all current and we all know current developments and so on. Um, we, uh, we ask you, if you are not a member of any one of those groups or not trained in any way, 
we ask you to take a bit of responsibility too. If, for example, you are in an area where the children's work is going on and you are not checked and not trained, we ask you to just respect the boundaries and to make sure that we keep those children safe. If you're aware of anybody who is a vulnerable adult, that you take your part in making sure that they're safe and protected and feel secure in this, our church, which should be a, a safe and comfortable space for them. So if you are concerned about anything and you think it's related to safeguarding, then obviously I am one of the people that you can talk to. And as I said, my contact details are around the place. Um, you can also, if I'm not around, mention it to any one of the leadership team and they, if it's relevant, can pass it on to me. So I hope that we all feel that this is a really safe place for us and that we are looked after and uh, safeguarding is important to us, which it is. And we ask you all to take a part in that and to be aware of it. And I just want to finish off by um, saying a prayer that hopefully we've created a safe space here and we need to all work together to keep it a safe space. So I'm just going to say this prayer together. Lord, help us to be a church that loves, welcomes, protects, listens, learns, serves, repents, restores, transforms, values, cares, believes. God of justice and compassion, hear our prayer. Help us, heal us, guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want... Uh, sorry to be a pain, Steve, sorry. Um, I just want you to know how much work Linda does and how brilliantly she does it. Um, she does so much work behind the scenes and um, just to keep us all safe and to keep it the highest profile in the church. And it's, a, it's actually quite a hard job um, because she's got, to work, she's got to work with me for starters. But, but with all of us, just... Um, it, asking us to do things we, we probably don't really want to do and and i get that but linda is just helping us to keep that profile really high I, I believe that we all respect very much the reasons that we do it but i just want to say thank you and i'd love to just pray for you in that role is that all right lord thank you so much for linda for all that she gives to this absolutely vital role and i pray that you would continue to empower and equip her in it thank you for the vision that you've given her that is just revealed so beautifully in the prayer that she's prayed for us um, but lord i pray that you would just um, continue to equip her, uh, restore her energy, and continue to envision her that we might all work together as the leadership of this church with this as the highest of priorities. In Jesus' name, amen. Sarah was sat there during um, when Linda was talking giving me signs and everything, and I was wondering what on earth. But anyway, no, not, not, rude ones. not rude ones, no, very nice ones, very nice ones. Um, in this church, sometimes we say the creed together, which is an affirmation of our faith and what we believe in. But instead of us saying it, we're going to sing it. So if you are able, please do stand as we come to our next song, Our Father Everlasting. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Please do take a seat. Carolyn, you're going to give us our reading, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading Peter um, to uh, verses 4 to 9, and it's NRSVA. Um, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I'm laying in Zion, a sto- I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is the word of the Lord. to have a stage hand on hand. There we go. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to be here with you today. Carolyn, thank you so much for reading for us. And um, Chris, I just wondered if you would keep the Bible reading up on there. Just the first screen would be fine because I'll be looking at that a bit as we go along. But as you know, we've been thinking about different images of the church Uh, looking at what the Bible says about who we are. We are the church. What does the Bible have to tell us about who we are, about our identity? And today we had that incredible encouragement from Peter's letter, as you can see four lines down up on the screen there, that we are to be a holy priesthood. And I don't just mean me, I mean all of us. Uh, And I wonder what you think about that. Now, when I was uh, potentially feeling a call towards uh, becoming a priest, becoming a church leader, I had to explain why I felt called to be a priest. And I found that extremely difficult. Uh, I was kind of put in remedial uh, tuition because I could not find the right words to talk about being a priest. And I think some of my issues with that were the image in my mind that I had of being a priest. Uh, I had in my mind the image of a very serious, a very holy, and a very quiet man. I'm going to be honest with you, didn't have loads of role models of women, and uh, I didn't really fit the bill, as you will appreciate. I didn't really fit any of those descriptions. And I wonder if you here also struggle a little with the idea that you are also priests. Uh, I'm sympathetic to you. So I want to take a look at some images, some pictures that will help us to see what it looks like for all of us to be priests. But I think it'd be really helpful if we just start at the very beginning, it's always a very good place to start, and go back to the idea of the temple in the Old Testament. So let's just uh, get a bit of stuff going here. Let me uh, get some Old Testament ideas of priesthood out. This uh, isn't an Old Testament robe. Now, an Old Testament priest had a pretty awesome robe. 
um, with, sorry, I was going to mess with my microphone, but I'm sure we'll be all right. An Old Testament priest would have had like a tunic with um, a load of stones on the front representing the, um, uh, all of the tribes of Israel. Now, the good news is my microphone's at the top here, so I think we're going to be okay. I'm not going to do it all up. I won't keep it on forever. Um, and I've got a stole that uh, they would have had all sorts of fancy schmancy stuff. So, and there would have been a bloke, obviously. Um, but that's all good. Um, so the other thing that um, they would do, let me just get me, uh, me lamb on. It's all right. We'll come to this in a minute. Not sizzling yet, but it's turned up to full, so I'm sure we'll get there. Um, you will remember that there was a temple back in the Old Testament. Before that, there was a tabernacle. It was a large tent set up by Moses as God instructed him to do. The Israelites came out of the wilderness, and Moses went up the mountain. He received ten commandments, and he received a lot more commandments than just the ten, actually, and one of them was build a tent in the wilderness and uh, teach my people to live as my people, said God. I want them to live a different way of life. Part of that will be demonstrated by the Ten Commandments. You're going to follow the Ten Commandments. That's going to be really different to how the rest of the world lives. And then if you've got Ten Commandments, I know you're going to break them because you're only human. So we're going to need a means to deal with that. And um, I'm going to give you these um, ways to deal with it. So God set apart a tribe, he set apart the Levites to be priests, and their job was to be an intermediary between God and the people, like go-betweens. The priests looked after the tabernacle, and then later on, on the instruction of David, Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, and the, te the temple there, built of these massive big stones, was a really important place because it was the place that God could be found on earth. He couldn't be found anywhere other than the temple, but you would go to the temple in order to meet with God. And the priests would kind of look after the temple. They couldn't get that close to God either. Uh, God was to be found in the Holy of Holies, and just once a year, the priests were allowed through a really thick curtain, uh, taking lots of precautions. Yep, my lamb's cooking nicely. I hope, I'm really sorry if you want any veggies. If you want any veggies who are going to be... I did talk to a veggie before I did this. They were like, no, we'll be all right. So they're not here. Uh, so if you are vegetarian, I know. I know, just, I know where they are, and it wasn't just because of the lamb, but I'm really sorry if this is offensive to you. But, but I, this is just Old Testament priesthood, right? Um, so the, these, these Old Testament priests, they, they would go to the uh, Holy of Holies once a year. They'd have to go through this thick curtain. They'd even have a rope tied to their ankle in case they were struck down by the power of God. But the rest of the time, the priests were responsible for making people right with God by making various offerings on their behalf. It's not burnt yet, but all these offerings are described in the book of Leviticus. Have a look there. It seems a bit strange to our ears. And of course, you've guessed it. That's why I'm standing here cooking lamb. Because most of the offerings in the Old Testament were lamb or goat. There was a bit that was, uh, there were a few doves here or there. Um, and it was all a means to deal with the sin of the people. I feel like I'm, I'd, much as burnt lamb's great, it won't be so good for my lunch, right? Um, it won't go to waste, I promise you that. The Old Testament priests helped the people to keep their relationship with God by making offerings to manage the sin of the people that kept getting in the way. So the temple and its priests were absolutely vital to the Israelites in the Old Testament. But actually, God always promised that his presence would be available to absolutely everybody in the world. Not just, oh, getting tasty here, I tell you. Mm, it's going to be nice. Uh, I mean, if I was a proper Old Testament priest, it would just burn completely to ashes and cinders, and that would be the offering to God. Um, 
the temple and its priests were absolutely vital so that uh, God could, the sin could be managed. But God had always promised that his presence would be found throughout the whole world, not just in a temple in Jerusalem. And frankly, all the animal offerings in the world don't solve the problem of sin. So why don't we just suck it? Let's just give up. I'll save it for lunch. Let's just do away with all these fancy robes. There we go. Let's take it all off. That'll help the microphone situation. I'm sure that uh, the AV team will be delighted. It's going to sizzle a little. Long. There we go. Let's just uh, stop the cooking there for a minute. Because we know that God had a perfect plan. He sent his son Jesus. And can you remember what John the Baptist exclaimed as soon as he saw Jesus? He called out, look, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the one who mediates our relationship with God. Jesus acts as our go-between. And of course, he did that in person while he walked on the earth. He healed the sick. He brought love and freedom and offered forgiveness for sins. And he died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice made once for all for the sins of the whole world. And as he died, that thick curtain that the priests used to have to go to to get to God's presence, that thick curtain ripped in two. So we don't need a priest or a temple in that Old Testament mold anymore. Now we have access to God through Jesus, through faith in his sacrifice for us. So Jesus acted as the ultimate high priest. He enabled us to have access to the presence of God, and he was the perfect sacrificial lamb. We don't need to be cooking lamb like this. We don't need to be um, burning lamb uh, and um, other burnt offerings to manage things when we get things wrong, which we inevitably will. So if Jesus is the ultimate high priest, the only one that we ever need, why in our reading is Peter still describing us as a holy priesthood? Well, let's take a look at our reading and I shall unplug the cooker because the smell of lamb is getting a little appetizing over here. There we go. Sorry if you're on Zoom. I hope you can kind of get the smelly vision thing and just imagine it. Right, so why, why is Peter describing us as a holy priesthood? That's, that's the question, isn't it? So our readings are going to help us with that. And I'm sure you noticed it talked an awful lot about stones. I think it mentioned stones about six times, something like that. But the stones take us back to that Old Testament imagery. It reminds us of the temple. It reminds us of how Solomon took the huge stones and built a house to, uh, to put God in, if you like, built that house where God would dwell on earth. And Peter quotes lots of scriptures. Um, that you can see lots of quote marks in that reading. He quotes from Isaiah and he quotes from Psalms. But rather than talking about the Old Testament times, those quotes are actually pointing forward to the new thing that God would do, to the new temple that God would create. And you can see there, it talks of the cornerstone, verse 6, for it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And a bit later on in verse 7, To you who believe he's precious, but for you who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. In other words, the cornerstone. Rejected, as we know, Jesus was rejected on earth. But Jesus himself is the cornerstone of this new temple on which every other stone depends. That's the basis of a cornerstone in a building, isn't it? That without that cornerstone, the rest of the building can't hold together properly. And Peter is inviting us to come to Jesus, come to him, a living stone. And uh, now we are filled with God's spirit so that we are also living stones. Um, that's what it says there. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So 
So we can really see how all our Old Testament imagery has prepared us to understand what Peter is talking about. As living stones built as a spiritual house, it's us now who fulfill the role of the Old Testament temple, the place where God's presence touches earth. We as this church, as individuals, but also as the community, are to bring God's presence to the world around us, to the people we meet, to the places that we live. Like the ancient Levitical priests, we're go-betweens for God between him and this broken world. We're to bring a little bit of his light and love wherever we go. So it tells us a little bit more there, doesn't it, about what on earth it means for each one of us to be a priest today. So if you look at verse 5 there, it tells us that we are to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And I wonder if we can think what on earth it means to be a spiritual sacrifice. We get some clues elsewhere in Scripture in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Paul urges us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is our true and proper worship. Paul is telling us to offer our bodies now that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Our whole lives are to be offered to God to serve him. This is what worship is. And I know Mary's going to talk more about that next week. And then in Hebrews 13, we read, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So here the sacrifice is to praise God, to speak of his goodness, as well as to do practical things, to do good, to share with others. In other words, exactly what Jesus told us to do when he asked us to love God our neighbours. We started with that image of the Old Testament priest. My lamb is still sizzling it away and I can cook it. Imagine what the old temple would have smelt like, although I guess it rapidly turned to the smell of burning. It's a good thing they didn't have fire alarms. Uh, They would all have gone off. Um, But you know, I think that was the kind of image maybe that I had in mind when I was trying to explain my own call to church leadership, to priesthood. But, you know, we are all called to the role of priest now. And you might say, well, why don't you take me dog collar off, Sarah? That's a perfectly legitimate question. It's a good question. Um, And the only reason, I'm not really wearing it for in here. I feel like I should take it off. I'm wearing it for out there. I've just got a head start on you guys, because at least people know what my role is. If you all had one, it would probably make your lives a lot easier in terms of sharing what you believe. I'll stick it on and make a lot of noise with my microphone. But, you know, we, those of us with dog collars... Sorry, do you want to mute it for a sec? No, good. so much yeah thank you so much we got it back up again those of us who are wearing dog collars or have other roles of leadership in the church are called into a role of leadership that's the important thing we're called to provide vision and encouragement and care as every single one of us lives out our priestly calling those of us with dog collars are here to encourage every single one of us to also be priests and so i just want to finish with a couple more pictures for us to take away. I don't want you to go away with the image of a bit of lamb cooking at the front of church because that's not necessarily the image that we're going to uh, helpfully take into our weeks, is it? Um, but I'd love us to take into uh, our weeks a couple of different images, those of today's priests, for, to help us to recognise what it's like for us to mediate God's presence in the world. So I've got my beautiful assistant, Steve, once more. And uh, Steve, oh, I haven't got the candle lighter. Where's I would do it off here? That'll be fine. There we go. So that's a smelly candle. Do you want to just wander around? Just see if you can waft a little smell around the place. <laughs> Don't burn anyone's nasal hair. Just waft. Waft gently. Wander around. We are to be the aroma of Christ. We're not to be citronella candles like Steve's wafting, but you get the idea 
that you, we are to be the aroma of Christ. In 2 Corinthians, we read that through us, Christ spreads in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing him. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So as we spend time with God, as we pray, as we ask God to meet with us, we're increasingly filled with his Holy Spirit, God's very presence. And people will smell that on us. So let me ask, I wonder, does the sense of God's presence that we bring into a room make people wonder where it's coming from? Steve's beautifully kind of putting the candle under our noses. We can see it. If I put it at the front and left it a while, you would eventually get a bit of a citronella smell and hopefully it would reduce the smell of cooking lamb. But you would wonder, possibly, if you just walked into the room where it had come from. We had a carry night the other week, didn't we? And those of us who walked into church the next day were left in no doubt of the aroma of curry in this place. But we are to be the aroma of Christ. Thanks, Steve. Do you want to just pop it on the edge? Thanks so much for being a wonderful assistant. You may, you may now sit for being the aroma of Christ in the place. But I wonder if people can smell something different, if they notice something different about us, if that smell lingers when we're gone, if it leaves people wanting more. So secondly, there's an image in the book of Revelation, uh, and it speaks of how the church is to be a lampstand, shining the light of God's truth and life and love out into the world. And Matthew 5.15 unpacks this further. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I'm not quite sure what a bushel basket is, but I do know I've got a lamp hiding. There we go. That's better, isn't it? I wonder if we sometimes get a bit hung up on doing good works, on actually doing things all the time. And do you know what? We can't run a church without people doing things. But also... People will see the grace and the love and the care and the welcome that we radiate as followers of Jesus, who are full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, maybe it's just me, but occasionally it does feel like no one would see any of that in me. And on a bad day, it's certainly true that can be a challenge for people to spot something of the Lord. But you know what? As Jesus followers, we actually can't help but be different we can't help but just have something of the aroma of Christ. We can't help but show something of his light. It, we just need to ask for more. We need to lean into it. We need to let people know the reason for the hope that they see in us. As the song goes, we just need to let our little light shine. We're not singing it later. Sorry about that. Maybe we should have, Stephanie. I didn't put a request in. Sorry about that. So I wonder how it's going for you. I wonder if the people around us know that we are Jesus followers. I wonder if they see something of our light. We'll all be called to shine it slightly differently, but I wonder if they see how we are shining our light. Or maybe that we just find it easier to hide it under a bushel basket. But we, this church, individually and as a community, are all priests crazy though that may feel. We are to bring God's presence into the world around us, to be go-betweens for God and this broken world. And these images help us to understand how on earth that could be, that we are to bring the lingering aroma of Christ's love wherever we go, and that we are to be a shining light of his hope. And I wonder how we will do that this week. So to finish, let's just say a prayer as we reflect on these images.
Lord, sometimes it feels kind of crazy that you would call every single one of us to be priests. And maybe we feel like we just want to pass on that responsibility. But nonetheless, you have given us that role. And we pray that you would help each one of us, and myself included, to take that seriously. Please would you show us how we can bring your presence, both as individuals and as a church. Please would you show us how we can be your love and light, your aroma in this broken world. And we pray that you would equip us with all that we need to share your love and to see your kingdom grow in this place and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, we can only be priests because of Jesus, our cornerstone. And that's uh, a way that we might respond now is just to turn to him as we sing together. My hope is built on nothing less. So when you're ready, would you like to stand and we'll sing together. Thank you. Please, please do have a seat. Peter, you're going to lead us in our prayers and our intercessions, I think. Uh, let's pray together. 
And let's think a little bit more on that thought of being a priest. And Father God, I want to thank you for your invitation to uh, make us your priests, your intermediaries in this world between the people around us and you, the loving God who cares for each one of them. Father God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit on each one of us. Send it on me. Make that, may each of us make that our prayer, that we would be enabled to serve you. We thank you for making us uh, the people in your place, to take this place in your plan. Father God, thank you for giving us this privilege. We pray for the, the skills and the abilities and the ability to use the talents that you've already given us to be able to carry that out in your world. We pray that you would build us like living stones into the church that you would have us be here. We pray that the aroma of your wonderful love would spread out into our society, our community, through uh, the work and the, that we do and the love that lives in us because of your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this church. Thank you for all that we have here. Thank you for all that we have in our lives, for the peace and security that we, we live in. We do pray for this church. We pray for Sarah and for Hannah uh, and ask for your guidance and protection on all that they do. Please bless them in their work. Encourage them and help them to be able servants of you here. And thank you for all that they do. We thank you uh, and ask for your blessing and strength on Cliff to, and his work in the prison. We pray that you'd protect him in that work and help him to be a blessing to those who, who need his help uh, in all the ways that he ministers to them. And we thank you for the other ordained ministers in, in our church here. Thank you that they're out serving you in other churches today. We pray that you would protect them and encourage them and help them through your grace in their lives to bring grace to others around them too. And we pray for each leader of the organizations and the things that happen in this church. I ask that you'd guide and strengthen and help them to be good at what they do. We thank you for our children and youth work leaders and ask that you'd be with them this morning as they lead their groups in all their work and their planning. Please guide and inspire them and help them to be able to bring forward those youngsters to, to your glory. We pray for all the work that goes on in this church, for our community and for serving you. We pray that people would meet with you, the living God, through the things that we do here. Father God, please strengthen us and help us to be uh, able and willing to do that for you. And Father, we lift up to you our world in turmoil at the moment. We pray for peace. We pray for an end to conflict. And we pray for protection of those who are caught up in all the things that we hear about and relief that's brought to those who have so little and at such risk. Father, we pray for Israel and Palestine that there would be peace and an end to conflict there and a restoration. We pray that relief would be able to be brought to those who are without the very basics that they need. We pray that you would wrap these countries around with a sense of love and peace instead of the sense of anguish and destruction that there is at the moment. And please wrap them around with other countries who would seek peace uh, and work for peace in that place. And that the conflict would through their work would not escalate into affecting other countries too. And we just ask for your wisdom and your uh, Holy Spirit in every leader that's got an opportunity to uh, impact this situation. Father, we pray too for Ukraine and the ongoing war there. We pray for an end to conflict, a chance for restoration, a chance for recovery of all those who are uh, at such a loss there too. Father, please bring wisdom and insight to all the leaders involved. We pray for your grace. And we pray for refugees from these countries and from other countries too, that there would be compassion for them and solutions that put them first. 
we pray for wisdom at the centre of all the the things that, that go on with, with the, the help for refugees. And uh, we pray for our government in their, their role in that. Father, we ask for wisdom amongst those who lead this country, for careful leadership, for compassion, for those who are disadvantaged, and ask that you'd help them to be strong and focused and wise in what they do and insightful for your, your values in our country. Father, so much to pray for, but we just lift our prayers up to you. Uh, in a short time of silence, let's lift up to God those who we know need his help at this time. Father, you know their needs better than we do, but we just lift those individuals to you and pray that you would be by their sides helping them and blessing them. Amen. And finally, let's draw all our prayers into the prayer that Jesus taught us. It's on the screen if you're not familiar with it. Uh, let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Shall we just uh, continue with a prayer to give thanks for the collection? Lord, we give you thanks for all things that you have given us. Help us now to be generous givers, both of our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in our community. We ask this through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen. So we're coming to the end of the service, so there's just a, a reminder of a couple of notices. There's morning prayer tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Yep, so morning prayer here tomorrow at 10 o'clock. That's followed by cafe from 11 till 12.30, and there's a cafe on Wednesday from 9 till 10.30. If there's anything that you think you need to be helped and prayed for, then please, at the end of the service, go to the back. There's some red chairs there, and there'll be some people there who will help you and pray with you. If... Um, if there's a bit of a queue or whatever, then please don't go away. Please just let them pray, and, and uh, then they'll pray for you as well. Uh, breakout rooms, obviously, after this, and tea and coffee. Breakout rooms for those on Zoom, and tea and coffee for those here. And Alison, you're standing at the back. You want to give a notice, I believe. did thank you very much um, can i first of all start by saying a huge thank you to all you wonderful people out there who have emailed me in the last couple of weeks um telling me how you can help out those of you who don't know me i'm alison and my role is the rotor and when sarah said what she said about the jobs <laughs> she's absolutely right church isn't about doing things but it does help when people are doing things isn't it sarah because it needs it frees up other people to go and do the welcoming and it does make the church a very welcoming place We've got Christmas services coming up. We have lots of extra services happening. And several of you have been absolutely fantastic. And you put your hand up and you said, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. I still have some gaps, though. If you've never been on the rotor before and you think, do you know, if I went to help with tea and coffee, somebody else might be able to do sides person, that would be a great thing. Come and see me. <laughs> I'm very approachable. Um, it's very easy to do. Um, if you have done sides... <laughs> Fiona and Andy are laughing at that. <laughs> we'll have words afterwards. <laughs> Not that approachable. <laughs> um, I've lost track. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you've done sides, um, been on the sides people wrote before and you know what you're doing with that and you haven't, you know, and you've just got your Christmas arrangements sorted and you think, oh, I could do one of those services, please come and see me. That would be really helpful too. And we've got a couple of services that are sort of at the slightly more at the beginning of the day and the very end of the day, <laughs> the slightly more, um, what, what's, what's the word, Sarah? Sort of unwelcoming hours, maybe. The very early in the mornings, I don't do those. The very late at night, I don't do those. <laughs> 
issues. <laughs> I'm very much a middle of the day person. But if you think you're coming to those and you could perhaps unlock and help set the church up on those days um, and things and be responsible um, for just making sure everything's set up away afterwards, again, please come and see me. It would be really helpful. Thank you. So. Oh, and sorry. And next Sunday, it's a communion. And if you're a sides person, I don't think we've got anybody on the rotor for next Sunday. So if somebody is knowing they're going to come be here and they're okay with doing the communion stuff, again, please come and see me or come and see Sarah. But we spotted that one. So. I just uh, thanks so much, Stephen. I just wanted to mention because it. I realised this morning that in two weeks today, it's our Advent service of light, uh, which feels awfully soon. So two weeks today, Advent service of light, about six o'clock on Sunday evening. It's a gorgeous service. Uh, we start in darkness. Uh, we bring in the light as we go through the service. Um, it's going to be gorgeous. Uh, so please do uh, come along to that, bring people along. It's relatively formal for us. Um, and then the following week is our carol service. That's less formal, but it is um, carols by candlelight um, and a great one to bring friends and relatives and neighbours and everybody you know along to. Uh, we'll extend back a little bit and open the church up. Uh, the school will be involved, there'll be choirs and all the rest of it. It's going to be brilliant, but that's only three weeks away. And then in four weeks, we're singing carols at the Cleveland Bay, something we love to do each year. The reason it all feels a bit soon is that the fourth Sunday in Advent is actually Christmas Eve. So we're kind of, normally we'd be doing carol singing on the fourth Sunday in Advent, but we're doing it on the third and everything gets pushed a bit earlier. If you're like, uh, really, church calendars, I'm not worried. It's just all a bit early this year because Christmas Eve's on a Sunday. Hey. But um, on the table by the AV desk, there are some flyers with all our Christmas services on there. They are perfect for dropping through your neighbour's door, giving to whoever. There's absolutely loads. There are more in the office if we run out. Please grab some and use them to invite people to stuff. We're going to do a short alpha course on a Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock in January, five sessions. So if you know anybody, you'd just like to know a little bit more about what on earth we're talking about when we're talking about Jesus, when we're talking about Jesus is Lord, who we follow, then that could be a really helpful time. I know it won't suit everyone, but it might suit some people. And there's an invitation on the back of the Christmas services. So please do grab that as you go. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, so our final hymn, let's stand if we're able and sing our final hymn, At the Name of Jesus.
<clears throat> May the peace of God reign in this place and the love of God forever hold us tight. May the Spirit of God flow through our lives and the joy of God uphold us day and night. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, in the name of, of Christ. Amen.